Well, joining me now is Republican Senator Mike Rounds of South Dakota. He happens to sit on two committees that are pretty front and center right now. The topics we're discussing today, armed services and banking. Senator Rounds, welcome back to Meet the Press. Hey, thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity. Let me start, actually, with a quick banking-related uh, question. It's a similar question I asked Senator Warren. Are we out of the woods in the next few weeks? Before we debate the longer-term issue of investigating and, and, and new regulation, are we currently out of the woods or not? The weekend's headlines seem to indicate we may not be. Yeah, my, my personal take on it is that it may take a couple of months to work its way through the system. Uh, I think we're going to be moving in the right direction. Uh, I did agree with what the Fed did and the Treasury did over the weekend to uh, stop the bleeding, so to speak, on the immediate aftermath. But longer term, I think uh, a lot of our regional banks and the smaller banks in particular are going to want some reassurances that they're going to be able to compete with the big ones, the big five. And so I think it's going to take a couple of months for consumers outside to recognize that all of these banks are stable. Um, should we, is it okay to let a bank fail? You know, it, let, let's think about this for just a second. When we talk about allowing a bank to fail, if it, it's one thing to say it's okay to allow the owners of a bank to lose their resources. It's another thing to say that uh, the depositors should necessarily be allowed to lose their deposits. That's mm -hmm. the reason why we begin with a quarter of a million dollars in protection. Perhaps that's not enough. You know, we started at 200,000 a few years ago. We bumped it to 250,000 per deposit. Then the question is, is whether or not that's still appropriate as things rise, as we have inflation and so forth. Should we bump that up? The other piece is, is whether or not within the commercial marketplace and among the banks themselves, can they uh, arrange for things such as interest rate swaps and so forth? Can they use those to actually uh, uh, protect themselves a little bit better? Kind of like buying reinsurance on those sure. accounts. So I, I think among them, there are some tools out there. The real question is, is whether or not all of the banks are taking advantage of the tools available to them right are now. Are you at all concerned, though, by protecting all these deposits? We're sending the message to the real high stakes private equity folks that, you know what? We'll always back you up, even if you make a stupid bet. No, look, at, and, and, and that's a really good question, but you have to remember that because of Dodd-Frank to begin with, we've identified that there are a group of banks, the very largest, mm -hmm. that we've identified as being too big to fail. And they are significant right. to the entire uh, financial services of the United States, and therefore it is, it is suggested very strongly right. that we won't let them fail. Now the question is, is, does that mean that they should have a competitive advantage over small and medium-sized banks when it comes to right. trying to, to lure depositors in? We want to make sure that the tools are available for those smaller banks to be able to spread the risk and so that if a depositor comes in and a lot of businesses will have right. more than a quarter of a million dollars in their accounts, when they do, should they be able to be assured that there are commercial uh, 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 products available that the banks are availing themselves to so that they can actually spread that risk out and those depositors then know that they're safe in the smaller regional yeah. banks uh, and that they don't have to move the deposits it, to a bank that may very well have challenges because they're so large, but that they have the backing of the federal government behind them. They are a SIFI. And I, I want to make sure that we don't skewer the, the, the competition between the very largest banks and those very, very needed medium and small so, banks that really do the vast majority of the commercial lending in the small communities across yeah. the entire United States. Seems pretty clear to me you do not believe that the 2018 <clears throat> rollback of uh, medium-sized bank regulation was a mistake. Um, so do you blame regulators for not overseeing this bank better? Well, let's go back in and just make it clear that this was a liquidity problem with regard to the, the failure uh, it, it, with, the bank, with SVB right now. Yeah. It was not a capital problem. And when we talk about the liquidity problems on it, even if you would have had the liquidity requirements that would have been there before uh, 2155, the, what we did in 2018, mm -hmm. This bank would have qualified already. There would not have been a change in terms of what happened. And even if even if they would have failed the tests, which they would not have, but even if they would have failed the tests at that time under Dodd-Frank, right. 
they still would have simply purchased more of those long-term treasuries and been solid again. So, no, it's very, very clear that yep. the portions of uh, 2155 that was done in 2018 did not impact this particular issue. The real question is why didn't the managers at SVB take advantage of a lot of right. the tools that were available to spread the risk out? Why, why did they use interest rate swaps for a period of time and then basically for the year previous to, to their failure, they quit using them? And, and, and why did they not have a chief risk officer in place from April until December? Why did they have a CFO that was operational during the previous yeah. year? Those are the types of things that the investigations should focus on. Yep. And then whether or not the actual auditing organizations, the folks yep. responsible, yep. the California Banking uh, Commission and the San Francisco Fed, yeah. did they do the audits appropriately? Were they providing adequate oversight? Okay, let me move to what uh, I started our conversation with in introducing you. And that was uh, Governor DeSantis's uh, uh, designation of the war between Russia and Ukraine as a territorial dispute. Do you agree with him? Look, I, I don't think it's a territorial dispute. While, while he may be taking territory, and it's technically accurate to say that there's territory being taken, this is bigger than that for us. I, I, I Focus on what our major issues are. And number one, China is our near peer competitor. They are our focus right now. Russia is right behind them. But in this particular case, you have a couple of items that bring it all together in the big picture. Number one, when we pulled out of Afghanistan the way that we did, that sent a message to both Xi Jinping and to Putin that we were mm -hmm. withdrawing from the, from the international scene and that maybe they could test the waters about whether or not we would actually exercise our capabilities internationally in the future. So taking out uh, the, the issue of Afghanistan and then moving into the fact that Putin now tests the waters by walking in or attempting to take over uh, a sovereign state right next to them that we had back in 1995 right. agreed that they would have sovereignty over that specific part of the land. Well, Xi yeah. Jinping looks at that and says, I'm going to watch this very carefully because Xi Jinping would like Taiwan and he's already committed that one way or another he's going to get it back. He wants to see how we respond and whether right. or not we can keep our allies together, whether or not state, yeah. uh, NATO stays together or whether or not it strengthens NATO. So this is a bigger picture than just territory. You think and the governor is misinformed? Is I think we have to stand strong on You think he's misinformed or I'm simply sure playing primary he's... politics here? Well, I, I think primary politics may very well have something to do with it, mm -hmm. but I think it's also a matter of looking at the big picture. And I'm not exactly sure yet, because I haven't seen the entire interview, if perhaps part of it was taken out of context in terms of how does that, re, how does that uh, uh, measure compared to other issues? And right. uh, do you look at the border as a big issue? Do you look at the economy yeah. as a big issue? Do you look at China as a big issue? And do you try to separate those out? I just think that what's going on in Ukraine can't be separated out from the major yeah. issues surrounding the United States' relationship with China. Unlike yourself, Governor DeSantis uh, rarely uh, allows reporters to, to ask follow-up questions. It was unfortunately in a statement to uh, to an uh, infotainer. Let me uh, ask you about former President Trump and his call for protesters to uh, the Manhattan courthouse next week. Um, you think that's appropriate behavior? To begin with, let me make it clear, there's a difference between the former president and what he did on January 6th as the president of the United States and his call for support at the Capitol versus a, uh, an individual person today mm -hmm. uh, asking people to show up to protest if he is indicted and recognizing that I'm assuming that you're talking about the possibility of an indictment which has not yet happened. We have no idea. Happened. Right. And second of all, we don't know what the indictments would be. So we're, we're kind of getting into some grounds in which we're making some assumptions that we don't have a whole well, lot of Well, he made the assumption. It that, might be better to ask those same questions no, later on. I understand that. Are you at all concerned, though, that this only adds to distrust? You know, it, it's sort of almost he's fomenting the distrust. Yeah, look, I, I, I don't know if he's fomenting distrust or not, but clearly... Uh, we don't know whether or not this is actually going to happen. We don't know whether or not there's actually going to be an indictment. Clearly, he's following some leaks, apparently, that are coming out of a DA's office that should not happen. But most certainly, you don't want to have any threats towards 
the implementation or the attempt to implement justice. And that's something that you always have to take seriously, whether it's from an individual person yeah. or a former president of the United States. I'm just curious, have you ever uh, had second thoughts about your decision not to vote to convict after January 6th with former President Trump? <laughs> It's very clear in the Constitution and the way that the Founding Fathers had laid that out that you were looking at, uh, at whether or not an individual was the President of the United States or was just an individual. At the time of that trial, uh, Mr. Trump at that time was an individual. He was not the President of the United States. Founding Fathers clearly did not want indictments to start on former presidents. They didn't want that to happen. They saw it going on in England at the time. And most certainly they don't want and they don't they didn't feel that it was appropriate to go back in and find former well, you officers barred, of the United you States barred him and, from ever, and impeach them. You could have barred him from ever running for office again. That was the point of that exercise. Actually, the idea behind an impeachment is to take away the shield of office. Yeah. That's all it does. After okay. that, other things can occur. But but and right now the shield of office is gone and now it's up to the courts. All right. Mike Rats. Uh Republican senator from South Dakota, former governor of South Dakota as well. It's always good to get your perspective on here. Thanks for coming on and sharing it. Good to see you. Thank you. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.